there are going to be four basic uh, components of my lecture today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and a summary of peace operations or operations led by the regional economic communities. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about their strengths and challenges, uh, focusing particularly on the cases of the uh, ECOWAS mission in the Gambia and the SADC mission in Mozambique. I'm going to Third, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think the role of the RECs ought to be uh, going forward in the African regional peace and security architecture, kind of very much building off of what we what we just heard. And then I was asked to, to give a little bit my thoughts on, on U.S. contributions to peace operations across Africa. So I'll include, include there. Um, so starting with the history. Um, so as I'm sure most of you know, historically, it's been the African Union and the UN that have authorized, mandated, and overseen a majority of peace operations in Africa. Um, but it's also true that Africa's regional economic communities play a crucial role. Um, they're embedded in the continent's peace and security architecture and notably have operational control over each of the African Union's five standby brigades that are part of the African standby force. Um, and from time to time, they have also undertaken peace operations at their own behest, independent of any African Union mandate, though they most often do get an AU endorsement. Um, in fact, uh, next slide. Um, by, by my count, uh, approximately uh, uh, 40 of the 40 African-led peace operations we've seen since 2000, around one third um, or 13, have been led by the regional economic communities. They're, they're right up here. Um, this includes six operations by ECOWAS, three by SADC, uh, two by the economic community of uh, Central African states, and one each by the East African community and the community of Saheli and Saharan states. Um, and I'd say reflecting a slow but steady devolution towards more localized approaches to conflict management, um, REC-led peace operations are becoming more and more common, um, uh, including there are there are four such missions today that are that are in operation today: the the SADC mission in Mozambique, uh, the SADC mission in the uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the ECOWAS stabilization support mission in the Guinea-Bissau, and the SADC mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and there are four out of the 13 current ongoing peace operations in Africa. Um, that is actually the next slide, although I'll ask that we can go to it now, but I see there's some folks still taking photos of, of, the, of the chart. Like most African-led peace operations, um, REC-led operations really stretch the meaning of the term uh, peacekeeping um, or peace operation because they tend to intervene in contexts where there isn't a lot of peace to keep. Um, this goes all the way back to what I think in the minds of many is the paradigmatic uh, LECRED operation. That would be the uh, ECOWAS monitoring group interventions in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, uh, and, and um, Guinea, um, comprising over 15,000 troops um, and conducted over the course of the decade. Um, this series of interventions ultimately led to lasting peace, but at, at very, very great cost. Um, so I'd say that today, modern kind of rec-led operations tend to look a little bit more like the two operations I'm going to talk about, uh, the ECOWAS intervention in the Gambia, otherwise known as ECOMIG, or the South African Development Community Intervention in Mozambique, otherwise known as, as SAMIM. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to talk, give an overview of them and talk a little bit about what they say about the, the strengths and weaknesses of rec-led operations. So uh, ECOMIG was launched in January 2017 in response to then President Yahya Jama's refusing to step down from power after being voted out in a 2016 election uh, at the request of the president-elect Adma Barrow, who had fled the country, um, ECOWAS, led by Senegal, assembled an intervention force of 8,000 soldiers, um, which began an invasion and, and forced Jama to step down. Uh, after Barrow took office, uh, a smaller force, which is currently at approximately 1,000 troops, I believe, um, remain to oversee the transition and has been there since, although there, there's talk of, I think, uh, uh, every year of, of, of ending the mandate. 
Um, uh, Samim, by contrast, was deployed in July 2021 to northern uh, Mozambique by SADC, uh, initially as a military-only mission under Scenario 6 of the African Standby Force concept as a, quote, peace enforcement mission to neutralize the terrorist threat and restore state authority, end quote, in Cabo Delgado region of Mozambique. It was deployed alongside the Rwanda Defense Forces, who were not part of the mission. Um, however, when its mandate was renewed in 2022, uh, the mission took on broader peace building, stabilization, and humanitarian assistance functions. And this is key. Um, during the time it's been deployed, uh, uh, the insurgent violence in the northern Mozambique has been reduced considerably. And I think it's it's fair to conclude that this reduction is at least partially attributable to the presence of the mission. Um, however, uh, earlier this year, it was asked to leave in favor of the Rwanda Defense Forces, which has become, I think, the preferred partner of the government of Mozambique, as well as the international community. Um, and I think both of these missions are good illustrations of the strengths and challenges of REC-led peace operations. So first, um, three strengths. Um, so it's important to note that both these missions were deployed in contexts for which traditional peacekeeping doesn't really have a good answer. Um, ECOMIG is among several, more than you might think, um, interventions that have been mandated in whole or in part as a response to an attempted or an un or direct unconstitutional seizure of power. Um, all of these kinds of interventions have been undertaken by African institutions, including, for example, the African Union, who intervened in 2008 to overtake uh, to overturn a renegade local government in uh, Comoros. Um, Samim, by contrast, uh, had a mandate to undertake operations against violent extremist groups, um, a challenge that traditional UN peacekeeping, with its emphasis on neutrality and the pursuit of political settlements, has elided. Um, Second, uh, both of these peace operations were at least partially successful. And I think an important reason why is that they were both reflective of a regional consensus on the need for an intervention of some kind. Um, traditional military minds who think in terms of capabilities, net assessment, net assessments and, and operational efficiencies are often deeply skeptical of peace operations. Um, but I think that regionally sanctioned interventions of this kind uh, tend to assess something that money can't buy and that no army can compel. And that's a shared consensus about a threat and at least some assurance that no country within the regional economic community authorizing the operation is going to act as a spoiler. And because I think regional actors have a critical say in the ultimate outcome of a conflict in their backyard, um, this fact alone makes these kinds of operations worth attempting. Um, third, and, and relatedly, uh, part of the reason I think we see a trend towards interventions being undertaken by the RECs is that they, they often are more attuned and responsive to the local security dynamics than other multilateral actors. Um, if one of the perceived benefits of AU-led interventions has been its ability to intervene rapidly in contrast to, say, for example, UN peacekeeping forces, um, it's becoming more and more clear that RECs are even more agile in that regard. There are less countries that need to come to a consensus, and when they are actually deploying forces because they're on the border of the, of the state in question or they share a border, um, they can be mobilized with a lot a lot more quickly with, with less logistical burdens than a traditional expeditionary peacekeeping force drawing from countries, at the very least across the continent and in some cases across the region, across the world, excuse me. Um, uh, and I, I think there is something to be said for having uh, the mandates of peace operations being crafted locally rather than in Addis or New York. Um, the mandate for ECOMIG, for example, was largely crafted by Senegal in consultation with other ECOWAS countries. And the intervention was implicitly endorsed only in, in one line of an AU communique, stressing the need to, quote, take all necessary measures in line with relevant AU instruments uh, and the desire expressed by the people of Gambia, end quote. And to note importantly, that, was, that, that mission was neither, neither uh, endorsed nor condemned by the UN Security Council. So it did not have, it had a very, very loose basis in international law, let me put it that way. So challenges. On, on the flip side, um, 
the flip side to more local ownership is that from another perspective, you might call many rec led interventions or, or a piece operations just regionally sanctioned uh, interventions by one or several countries in the affairs of a neighboring country. Um, as I just alluded to with the case of, of ECOMIG, they often have a bare or minimal basis in international law. Uh, they are not held to the same accountability standards as UN peacekeeping missions. And there isn't a lot of systematic research we have on their effectiveness, unlike the dozens, if not hundreds of studies that have been undertaken on UN peacekeeping missions. Um, and while it is, I think, helpful to have to the helpful that, that they often reflect consensus, a potential downside to that is that they tend to reflect more than anything the will and the interests of powerful countries or hegemons within a region. In the case of ECOMIG, for example, that would be Senegal, which completely surrounds the Gambia and was the main, the main uh, force, motivating force behind ECOMIG. In the case of Samim, uh, the anchor state there was, was South Africa, who's contributed, I think, a plurality of, of the troops to that mission. Um, second, um, rec-led missions have tended to be smaller than UN peacekeeping missions or AU-led missions, such as the African Union mission in Somalia. Um, this, I think, reflects both the intervention capacities of the states within RECs, but also some of the regional dynamics I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, in retrospect, ECOMOG's experience looks like it may have been an aberration. You had 15,000 troops deployed over a decade or more, and, and no, no subsequent intervention by a REC has become similar to, to that scope and scale. Um, in fact, uh, ECOMIG is the next largest intervention that, that I can find that's been undertaken by a, a REC, and it was uh, 8,000 troops that were mobilized at its height and only very briefly as sort of coercive diplomacy to kind of get uh, Yamia to, to, to flee from office. And it's also important to note that, that it was made possible largely because the Gambia was surrounded by Senegal and only had an army of 2,500 soldiers. So, you know, it was a relatively easy operation, I think, as far as things go. Um, Third, and relatedly, uh, limited interventions also reflect limited capacities. Um, this includes specialized enabling capabilities like intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, air support, and medevac, but also key capabilities that are crucial to enabling uh, population-centric warfare, which I would argue you need is crucial to, 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 to succeed in, in conflicts across the continent. Um, the AU and the UN particularly each have doctrine that is supposed to include civilians and civil affairs officers to engage in the delivery of humanitarian assistance, conduct dialogues, and address the gender dimensions of armed conflict. Um, you know, a key reason why Samim was asked to leave uh, was because it was not able to deliver on the kind of humanitarian access or stabilization capabilities it was mandated beginning uh, in the second year of its deployment. Um, and instead, this is a task that has been mostly given and undertaken by external donors or international actors who are working through the government of, of Mozambique with, with varying degrees of challenges. Finally, and, and, and I think probably most importantly, and this is something that we heard a lot of in the last presentation, there needs to be better coordination within the RECs themselves. Um, there are plenty of security threats that span borders between RECs. Um, and these threats have, have tended to spawn ad hoc regional coalitions to respond to them. Um, this was the case, for example, with uh, the multinational joint task force in the late Chad Basin and the G5 Sahel. They were largely recreated because uh, the countries of Cameroon, Chad, and Mauritania were not in ECOWAS and did not have great relations with ECOWAS. Um, um, it's also the true, as we, as we heard from the last presentation, when there are countries that are not in a regional economic community having or overlapping uh, regional economic communities having deep interests in the outcome of a conflict. And, you know, the, while the proliferation of ad hoc mechanisms or organizations to manage various security challenges is in some cases effective, it also, as we just heard, is very duplicative and I think reflective of, a, in some ways, an architecture that is still growing and, and unsound. Um, you know, with, with Samim, the fact that Rwanda was not aligned or under the purview of SADC or a broader AU mission authorized led to poor information sharing, a lack of interoperability, and challenges with establishing a coherent and effective 
strategy and command and control between the government of Mozambique, uh, the Rwanda Defense Force, and the mission itself. Exactly the same kind of challenges we just heard General Monica talk about are, are, are occurring in the, in the, in the DRC. Um, so third, um, what, what should be done about this? Um, I, there, I think there are three recommendations I would make about how to better align and utilize the regional economic communities within the broader African security architecture. Um, first, uh, there needs to be a more coordinated and systematic approach to addressing cross-border security challenges and to incorporating either troop contributing countries or other regional states that are not members of a particular regional economic community in addressing and mitigating conflict. It is simply not sustainable uh, uh, or effective to create a new initiative or beef up an existing regional organization that did not have a security mandate to respond to every cross-border security threat or every time countries that span RECs want to be involved in some kind of peace operation or conflict resolution process. Um, I would propose for kind of each challenge three uh, complementary, but not, not necessarily exclusive options. So thinking about particularly the case of Samim. Um, either we could see regional economic communities uh, intervening in collaboration with one another, which would have made Samim a collaborative mission with either ECAS or the EAC. Um, secondly, um, the regional economic communities could add states who have needed capabilities or who are on their borders in cases where they are affected by the conflict. Uh, through some kind of more flexible mechanism to deal with added troop contributing countries. In that case, that would have been a static mission where you had Rwanda somehow under the purview of it. Or um, you could have these interventions be mandated by the African Union and made a more formal part of the stand of, of, of the African Union doctrine, in which case either the mission would have been AU led or possibly you could receive some kind of AU static type mission. I think those are the those are the challenges. Um, Second, as uh, de facto managers of the African standby force, and relatedly, I think a lot of rec-led efforts need to focus on making the ASF at the brigade level more flexible and efficient. Um, it needs to be able to better, each, each brigade needs to be better able to conduct joint operations with forces external to its region and to incorporate ad hoc missions into its command structure. Um, and finally, uh, it is imperative that the RECs and other African multilateral organizations develop capacities to manage conflict that go beyond the deployment of force. Um, they need non-military capacities to assist with peace negotiations, ceasefire monitoring, political settlements, stabilization, police, the provision of humanitarian assistance, uh, justice sector services, et cetera, in contested or occupied areas. And the lack of these capabilities, if you recall, was one of the key reasons why Samim was asked to leave Mozambique. Um, I think the UN, the AU, and other external actors are well suited to work with the RECs to further kind of advance and develop these kinds of capabilities. Um, although they vary, I would say they vary across RECs. Um, finally, and, and lastly, concerning the role of the United States. Um, as many of you know, no doubt aware, uh, the US has played a key role in advancing peace and security across Africa through its support for peace operations. Um, first and foremost, it supports peace operations through assessed contributions, uh, which through which it contributes uh, to a quarter of the UN peacekeeping budget. Um, and you know, while I think that UN peacekeeping operations have been on the decline for about a decade, uh, I think the evidence is incontrovertible that, that UN peacekeeping have contributed to African peace and security markedly. And I'm happy to talk more about this in, in Q and A. Um, second. Uh, the U.S. often provides bilateral uh, or logistical support to peace operations of various kinds uh, to troop contributing countries. Um, and these programs, which have included the Global Peace Operations Initiative and the Africa Contingency Operations Training and Assistance Program, I would argue have been incredibly successful in enabling African countries to contribute to peace operations. As a direct result of these kinds of initiatives, hundreds of thousands of African uh, peace, uh, peacekeepers have served in peace operations all over the world. Um, Africa not only makes up uh, the vast majority of peacekeepers in Africa, but around half of the world's peacekeepers. And a number of African nations, including I think many of those present here today, have been able to professionalize their militaries in whole or in part by taking, taking uh, uh, part in these peace operations over the course of several decades. 
And, you know, though they might not be broadly recognized outside of Africa, um, I think these kinds of programs serve as a model for how to do security cooperation effectively. And we should be thinking about how to replicate these programs for a world of more localized uh, African-led interventions. And so I think some of the key elements that have made these programs a success are, are number one, um, a commitment to basic equipment and training standards that sure a basic level of effectiveness and operability. And the incentive here, especially when it comes to serving in UN peacekeeping operations, is it's competitive. And if you do not meet that standard, you are not fit to serve in a peacekeeping mission. So, you know, there's no there's 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 no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, second, it includes training on key elements of peacekeeping and conflict resolution, which I think are are very much needed by uh, by Reclet operations by the AU, which include things like respect for the laws of armed conflict, peacekeeping principles, human rights, uh, humanitarian assistance, and international law. And third, and perhaps I would argue most importantly, there's a degree of continuity. Um, trainings tend to be repeated over time, and, and, and the long time horizons have helped ensure that individual units who receive training don't lose capabilities over time or immediately disbanded upon returning to a host country. I mean, one of the one of the things that if you really get in the weeds of, of, of how uh, training works, and there's a great article by the Africa Center acting director, Dan Hampton on this subject um, in 2014, I, I encourage you all to read it, that, that, that units lose their ability to conduct operations over time if they're not continuously trained. And I think to some extent, these programs have ensured for, for units that are contributing to peacekeeping operations, a level of continuity and continued training that, that has made them more effective than some of the, I think, one-off kinds of programs you might get otherwise. Um, so, you know, I think if these elements of, of U.S. support to peace operations were more broadly institutionalized, um, I think it could do a great deal more to enable African security sectors, militaries to, to enable themselves to address African solutions, uh, enable themselves to address African security challenges independent of any external assistance. So uh, thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions.